thanks everyone for joining us from all over the world today to discuss and share experiences on why and how to manage risks by working with nature. The event is one of the many events hosted by IED as part of the Development and Climate Days at the Understanding Risk 2020 Forum this year. My name is Xiaoting, your moderator today and a senior researcher at IED based in England. So in the next 50 to 55 minutes, we would like to discuss with all of you why and how to manage risks through nature-based solutions. The session builds on an earlier session today that I hope some of you joined that highlighted why biodiversity loss is an underestimated risk for us and should be tackled jointly with climate change risks and many other risks we're experiencing in this day of age. And the nature-based solution are actions that protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems to address those interlinked societal challenges like biodiversity loss and climate change. Done well, nature-based solutions can have very wide-reaching economic, social, and environmental benefits. For example, biodiverse agricultural production systems can help farmers reduce the risks of loss of pollinators, soil degradation, as well as helping them manage the risks of climate change, including drought and floods. Mangroves and coral reefs can help reduce the risks of severe storm surge damage to coastal communities and provide them with diverse income through tourism and sustainable fishing. In today's event, we'll hear from representatives from government, farmer, and the private sector sharing their perspectives and experiences. We are also looking forward to learn and hear from all of you in the audience, and we'll try to make this virtual session as interactive as possible. Though we won't be able to see you on this virtual platform, the virtual space does offer all of us many ways to actively participate. So throughout the event, please feel free to share your perspectives, experiences, reflections on what you heard from speakers or what you have experienced in your own line of work on why and how to manage risk through nature-based solution. You can put those into the chat box. You're also welcome to leave questions to the speakers in the chat box. Please specify which speaker or speakers the question is directed to. If you see any questions other participants ask you really like, you can also say in the chat box that you're interested to learn the answers to the same question. At the very end of the session, we'll have about 20 minutes today for all the speakers to respond to your questions after the presentation. So if there's any question that we feel many people expressed interest in, then we can prioritize those. And feel free to answer each other's questions well if you feel like your experience can contribute to the answers. We do really encourage you all to interact with each other in the chat box throughout the event. So in addition, you can also engage in the discussions through Mentimeter. So based on your experiences and what you hear from speaker today, you can use one word to answer the following question. What benefit can nature-based solution bring to managing risk? Throughout the event, you can go to menti.com and use the code 5409540. You can enter one word each time when you use the code. But as you get inspired throughout the event by speakers and each other, you can always go back to the Menti and enter new words and new ideas. We will look at the final result from Menti at the end of the event. And uh, I think one of my colleagues can also pop this mentee instruction into the chat box. So you can always refer back to the code and the instructions throughout the event. So now I would like to invite our first speaker all the way from South Africa, Mike Jennings. Mike is the strategic grant manager at South African National Biodiversity Institute. He has over 10 years of experience in developing and overseeing the implementation of climate change adaptation projects. Mike will share with us why and how South African governments have been managing risks through nature-based solutions. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, thanks very much, Shouting. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mike Jennings, and as Shouting said, I work for the South African National Biodiversity Institute, which is a government institution under the, the Department of Environment, Forestry, and Fisheries. I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about one of the projects that Sandy oversees, the Mgeni Resilience Project, which is funded by the Adaptation Fund. So this project is not government funded, but it is led by local government, and it is very important, a very important pilot project to demonstrate the value of nature-based solutions in managing risk at the local government level. Essentially, what the project is aiming to do um, is, is influence relevant policies and procedures 
to change the way that government funding is directed to better manage climate induced risks. So this next slide is uh, just to give you an idea about what the landscape looks like where the Evgeny Resilience Project is implemented. It's rural, it's remote, steeply sloped, community members have to travel on foot um, and have to cross rivers to get to schools, clinics and, and transport nodes. It's, it's forested in places, heavily infested with alien plants on the slopes, with grazing lands in the valley bottoms, and there's lots of subsistence home gardening and livestock grazing, and generally a high dependence on ecosystem goods and services. The, the climate threats in this area, which, which are already being experienced and are forecast to get worse, um, are increase in severe rainfall events and storms, leading to, to flash flooding down these steep slopes, and also strong winds and lightning as well as increases in temperature and number of hot days uh, and seasonal shifts and longer dry spells leading to, to drought and increased fire risks. So communities living in this area are, are extremely vulnerable and at risk to climate-induced disaster events. So uh, uh, briefly, these, these climate threats are, are exacerbated by a whole bunch of, of non-climate-related non -related, non -related issues. Uh, I won't spend any time on them, but the, the so-called triple challenge in South Africa of poverty, inequality and unemployment Poorly constructed houses, like the, the example in the, the top left of your screen. Poor land use planning and ineffective enforcement or policing of regulations, such as houses being built within wetlands, such as the, on the top right. Dense informal settlements with a whole suite of issues in the bottom left. And then sleep, uh, steep slopes uh, and widespread erosion and ecosystem degradation, such as on the bottom right. So back to the, the eco ecological infrastructure part of the project. So this is an example of a typical grassland in the area. Uh, the, the climate change induced shifts are resulting in late onset of rains in a longer dry season. And what that means is that cattle are on the grasslands for longer than they should be, which leads to overgrazing. When, rain do, when rains do fall, as I said, they're now often in severe thunderstorms, which results in, in the loss of topsoil and extensive gully erosion and, and downstream deposition of facilities, which essentially is, is compromising the ability of wetlands in the area to attenuate flooding, and deliver other ecosystem goods and services on which the local community are so dependent, and at the same time is decreasing the carrying capacity of the grasslands. This perpetuates uh, additional overgrazing um, and increases the risk of flooding and the risk to livelihoods of local communities. So it's a, it's a negative cycle um, caused, by, caused by climate change. So while that's coming up, in, in response to this, the, the Mgeni Resilience Project has adopted a nature-based solutions approach to address these risks that are, are exacerbated by climate change. There are several integrated interventions being implemented, such as the restoration of, of grasslands and wetlands, some of the planning, which you can see here in the picture, the removal of alien invasive, alien invasive plants, cutting of fire breaks, and working with communities and traditional authorities to put in place grazing management plans, all aimed at addressing the issues I just met, uh, mentioned. There are also a number of complementary interventions that are not necessarily nature-based, such as early warning systems for flooding, when the attenuating ability of the restored rivers and wetlands is simply exceeded and communities need to, need to leave the river catchments, um, as well as early warning systems for fire, lightning and drought. And then there's a program of work focused on the built environment, um, as well as climate smart and regenerative agriculture, but I, but I won't go into those now. You'll see in this next slide, there's a couple of photos. On the left is an example of a gully uh, before and during restoration, and we haven't quite got to the, the after yet, but, but what I really want to highlight here is, in addition to the, the on the ground restoration work, is the capacity building awareness and policy work that the project is, is undertaking. At a community level, there's been a huge amount of awareness raising material that has been developed um, and shared, like uh, info sheets and flyers in, in local languages, such as on top there, um, and all sorts of graphics that have been uh, you know, talked through with the community, as well as capacity building aimed at bringing communities into the design of the interventions, with the ultimate goal of instilling a sense of local ownership based on an understanding of value of these nature-based solutions, which then means the ecological assets are, are protected. At a local government level, there's been a different, different type of awareness raising and capacity building with government decision makers. Um, there's been policy work to identify which policies to target to integrate these nature-based solution approaches into ongoing operations of local government with associated allocations of, of budget, which is of course vital. As part of this project, um, a, a toolkit was developed aimed at decision makers and traditional authorities to, to mainstream these, in, in this case, ecosystem-based adaptation solutions into local planning. In some sense, it's, it's, it's been a, an easy sell. Um, the, the disaster management officers at local government level are mandated to respond to incidents after disasters occur. 
and they are inundated with calls after these climate-induced disasters strike. Um, and what it ends up looking like is, is these officers handing out relief packages, so responding retrospectively to risk. And the idea is to, to redirect government budget to take a uh, more of a proactive approach, uh, including a focus on nature-based solutions to mitigate these risks and, and prevent or reduce the impacts of these climate-induced disasters. Um, it's just a, another landscape shot um, of, of the area uh, where some of the alien invasive removal has taken place. Um, I think the area is, is, is beautiful. If you live there, obviously, you know, you're exposed to a whole, whole suite of, of, of risks, as I've described. And then the next slide is just the last slide, which shows some of the community beneficiaries. Um, in this case, if we go to the next slide, uh, a women's farming cooperative that was established in the area. So um, I focused on this project. Sambi is, is also developing a very interesting project under the Green Climate Fund, which is taking this and a whole bunch of ongoing nature-based solution of policy work to scale through what we call an ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction project. That's only a proposal now, so I didn't want to focus on it, but perhaps there'll be a chance to talk more in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. I believe that's, that's my seven minutes. Thanks, Aya. Bye. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for highlighting that how the triple challenge of poverty, climate change, biodiversity risks are all interlinked and can is exacerbate each other and causing the negative cycle. And how nature-based solution coupled with other technologies can work together effectively to monitor, assess, and proactively manage those interlinked risks. And also highlighting the importance of bringing in local voices and the values to make those solutions work. And I just want to say welcome to all the people who just joined us, please do keep introducing yourself in the chat box. And then remember, we also have a Mentimeter going, which has a link in the chat box. Please follow that as well. And then I would like to invite our second speaker who will take us all the way from South Africa to Asia, uh, Wuli Ival, who is a senior advisor for Forest Farm Facility at the Vietnam Farmers Union. Viva has deep experiences and interest in policy advocacy, education, and training to enhance the capacity of farming organizations. And she has a lot of experience developing community-based and nature-based solutions in forest and agriculture sector. So over to you, Viva. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yvonne. I work for Vietnam Farmer Union. And uh, today I'm very pleased to talk with you how VNFU integrate the uh, NBS into risk management for forest and farm producer. Uh, Vietnam Farmer Union, we have more than 10 million uh, members in home country in the forestry sector, agriculture, fishery, etc. in rural development. And uh, one third of them, they are living in forestry and forest landscape and mountainous area. This is why today we talk about the how we can help them to to, to manage the uh, uh, risk. Uh, uh, do you know that the farmer have many uh, problems? First, we, we see that the biodiversity loss due to the above uh, 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 chemical and uh, deforestation, uh, soil erosion already pose a big risk to farmer in Vietnam because the farmer uh, lost the access to natural resources and culture heritage that are important for their farming and forestry business uh, and way of life. Uh, and uh, the, this risk uh, is uh, composed by climate change and more frequent and several flood and uh, draw impact the production for farm and uh, forestry product every year and this year we have the COVID is the impact to their life more seriously because uh, some uh, product uh, uh, bro broken uh, supply chain and uh, it may be the worst the, the, uh, worst why the, uh, the, to mention how small farmer and uh, especially uh, as a risk to uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, the, that uh, you can say uh, that they uh, often have limited resources and capacity to manage the, their risk, uh, and um, the lack of uh, financial services, for example, the insurance 
and uh, some other uh, credit that uh, can help farmers uh, mitigate, mitigate, mitigate their risk. And how Vietnam Farmer Union to integrate the NBS uh, into risk management. First, we use a participatory approach in home process to help them. We carefully to listen to farmer and to identify the risk and uh, the, 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 the difficulty and how we can use uh, NBS to respond to their um, problem. And we organize a roundtable discussion at all level. And this is a key to open the door and engage the local uh, authority, public and private sector to support and work with FAPO to manage risk through the NBS we present for them. And we organize a training for a training group for, for, for farmers in different subjects, including the risk management and business planning. We improve their, their capacity and based on the NBS and risk management uh, strategy. And uh, we also uh, uh, support them to, to work on business like business incubation and a value chain approach linked with the responsible, responsible natural resources skills uh, in business planning, contract farming with the company and private sector to supply and uh, uh, the develop the sustainable product chain with the uh, certification like the organic farm, uh, organic certification, participatory warranty system for small farmer uh, certification or global uh, gate or Viet uh, gate we use in Vietnam, etc. And uh, we organize a peer-to-peer -peer learning and, uh, and exchange visit among the farmer and they can uh, uh, learn each other through this uh, activity and they create uh, some uh, idea uh, among farmer, yes. And how we continue to work with farmer, Vietnam farmer. We uh, we not only work with farmer, but we also work with the uh, policy uh, set, uh, policy maker here in uh, other um, in uh, uh, with the other ministry. And now we uh, encourage uh, and uh, work advocate how we develop the, some policy on. Uh, uh, agric, uh, forest and uh, 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 forest and agriculture uh, combination policy, and uh, we continue to support FAPO to implement NBS sustainable forest and farm practices organic certification to respond to the risks, and uh, we continue to uh, to work with the uh, farmer to assess the risk and uh, in their landscape and supporting them to implement the forest landscape approach to use the NBS to manage the monthly risk and like the biodiversity loss and uh, climate change. And uh, we still uh, work with the farmer. It is uh, especially important to not that the, we support farmer to uh, build in systematic risk management and management into their business. We also train those farmers to use the ecosystem, um, uh, ecosystem based approach and uh, to manage uh, those uh, risks and uh, develop product value chain with the private sector and sustainable sustainable in sustainable way yes and uh, we continue to uh, work with other stakeholders and uh, we um, make the communication and propaganda for the people for the people understand what is the nbs and how we can nbs approach to solve the problem with the society thank you very much 
Thanks, Yvonne. Well, thanks for sharing the interesting experiences from Vietnam and how those risks can actually be incorporated into business models and uh, business incubations. And the fact that a way to promote nature-based solutions implementation is not only important to understand the technical side, but it's also important to work with policymakers, build different capacities. There's various other work we need to do to make nature-based solution for managing those risks, important risks for vulnerable farmers into their business models. So now we're going to switch landscape. We have been on land, but we're now going to go to the ocean side and the um, mm -hmm. Well, Wes Chip Cunliffe, the Director of Sustainable Development and the AXA XL. Chip established and managed AXA's Ocean Risk Initiative, which works to identify innovative insurance and finance solutions to the impacts and implement, implications of ocean-related risk. He also co-chairs the Ocean Risk and the Resilience Action Alliance that, that was launched in 2019. Over to you, Chip. Sure thing. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Look, as as um, Xiao Ting's just said, I've uh, I do run this Ocean Risk Initiative, and the idea is to is integrate um, nature-based solutions into our risk management risk management solutions. Um, we know that uh, coastal ecosystems, of, of course, provide that protective uh, barrier, uh, but of course. Uh, and yet they also provide jobs and livelihoods and food security and, and carbon sequestration and biodiversity uh, alongside. And yet I think we're still um, very aware that they are still under, undervalued and probably readily incorporated into risk, model, risk management strategies and indeed models as well. And yet I think that um, they are a critical uh, component of disaster risk management and, and indeed climate adaptation in countries that, that lack that financial resource to fund uh, relief and recovery and, and, and post-disaster reconstruction efforts. Uh, we know that you know, 800 million people will be at risk from storm surge linked to, to extreme weather events by 2050. Um, the insurance industry has paid out over $300 billion in the last 10 years for coastal storm damage. And yet, given that uh, not everybody has insurance, it's quite likely that uh, huge amounts of money will have been paid out uh, by the, uh, the lender of last resort, so, uh, so governments themselves. And so the, the, the UN has asked for a transformative response in this space. Um, and I think there's a real need to shift um, the trajectory um, by anticipating the risks through mitigation, but also through adaptation as well. And that, of course, links to, to nature-based solutions. Um, we know that there's been quite a lot of work to, to, um, to, to, pr to calculate the protective benefits of ecosystems. Um, and in terms of mangroves and reefs, that's particularly important. Um, research suggests that uh, for a 100 year storm event, flood damages would increase by 91% um, to over $270 billion if you took those reefs away. And indeed, if you, if you look at mangroves, you know, they, their flood protection benefits uh, are, are worth about $65 billion a year. Um, and so if you take those away, you're looking at 15 million more people being flooded annually across the world. I think that given that the, the nature has spent many millions of years protecting those coastlines with, those, with, with nature itself, then it seems a logical next step for us to be able to integrate the protective benefits into our risk man management approaches. One of the things that we are doing, in fact, before I go on to this coast risk index, um, last month we... Uh, uh, we announced uh, and launched a feasibility study with our uh, with the Nature Conservancy and the University of California Santa Cruz on the feasibility of developing a mangrove insurance product. Um, the idea is to assess the risk reduction and benefits of, of mangroves across the Caribbean and we examined the the opportunities for, for developing mangrove and indeed indemnity products um, to cost the to, 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 to cover the cost of restoring mangroves after a severe weather event. And we found that um, over 3,000 kilometers of coastline uh, in seven different countries across the Caribbean have favorable market conditions for that, uh, for that kind of insurance. But looking at this coastal risk index, well, the idea behind this is really to, to, um, to price risk with and without healthy reef and mangrove ecosystems. So of course, if you take away a reef, the risk profile uh, on land will change, whether that be for a, an asset or a community. 
Um, and so the, the, the idea behind the index is, is sort of, um, is very much to look at three different areas. One is the, the, the risk to physical assets from storm surge and sea level rise. Um, a second piece is about assessing social vulnerability and flood hazard. Um, and then thirdly, to, to look at the, the risk to income streams um, linked to the degradation of those ecosystems. And the idea is really to, to uh, uh, enable us to transfer that risk from coastal communities. Um, it's certainly to be able to help multilateral agencies to better assess the risk profile of target countries. Um, but then looking at the more sort of the localized level is, is to assist those local policymakers to map their liabilities um, and to, to direct those funds more effectively. And of course, all of, all of the above will help us to protect and manage more sustainably those ecosystems as well. So just in terms of the, the, the links to um, vulnerable communities, uh, as Xiaoting said, um, I co-chair the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance, which has an aim of driving $500 million worth of investment into nature-based solutions along coastlines by 2030. Um, it, it's been, all the G7 countries signed up to it. We're working with uh, members in the global south um, and our focus is very much on the small and developing states and, and emerging economies. But we're also working across private sectors and the NGO and MDBs as well. And as you can see here, there are three different pillars. Um, one about practice innovation, science and research and policy and governance. And more specifically, um, in, the, in the Philippines working with RARE, we're working on um, linking uh, fisher folk to more formal financial services. So using microinsurance to strengthen uh, the financial res resilience of fisher folk. Um, and the idea then is be to be able to decrease the need to overfish in those waters and in increase the adaptive capacity of communities um, and, and building the resilience of the local economy. When we're focused on science and research, we're working with the St Stockholm Resilience Centre uh, on, on a couple of pieces of research. One is about uh, addressing the gender dimension of ocean risk, as we see in, uh, on this slide, but also we are developing and, and assessing emerging opportunities and risks uh, for small island developing states and, and LDCs uh, from, the, from the growing blue economy. Um, and then finally, um, we as Aura itself is, is really trying to promote the enabling policies to drive investment into those uh, most vulnerable uh, areas of the world. So look, I think that just to wrap up, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that can be done. I think there's, there's some work, well, we are obviously starting work in this space, but I think nature-based solutions can and should be integrated into risk management solutions uh, ongoing. Xiao Ting, back to you. Thanks so much, Chip. Thanks for highlighting those stacking numbers at the beginning that really brings home the message why we need to work with nature to manage those climate change risks. And very interesting to hear those innovative ways from the insurance sector on how moving towards building those risks in insurance approach so nature's role in disaster risk management can no, is not, no longer really underestimated. And I just want to remind everyone to ask questions to the speakers. We really want to hear from you and also participate in the Mentimeter. And with that, I'll just try to invite every speaker, all the speakers back. There is one question that been posed by the participant. And so all the speakers talked about how nature-based solution can benefit human and human societies through many different ecosystem services. I think the question more is more about than uh, do you, from your experience, working with nature and those nature-based solutions, how does then it impact nature itself? Is there any evidence that, that actually those approaches that you see in communities, Mike, I think with you, restoration in South Africa's drylands and the grasslands and then uh, evolve in Vietnam, working with farmers for different, more sustainable agri agroforestry, farming activities and forestry activities and the chip in the ocean landscape where the mangroves and the uh, coral reefs being restored. Have you seen the impact on nature itself? Can it help nature itself also to recover from the various risks nature face at the moment? So I think maybe we go back to Mike first. 
Sure, Shouting. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, I do agree. Uh, certainly uh, from, from Sandy's side, a, a focus of the adaptation fund is on the most vulnerable populations. So, so a lot of our work focuses on, on how nature-based solution, solutions can build the resilience of those vulnerable communities. But at the same time, um, there's absolutely benefits for, for, for nature or for ecosystems. Um, you know, the, the areas where we are working are, are, are degraded. So through um, you know, these, these restoration and rehabilitation um, practices or through protecting intact areas, strategic water source areas are a good example. Um, you know, there's, there's improved ecological functioning, there's biodiversity benefits, there's, there's carbon sequestration that happens in soil carbon and, 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 and all, all, all a whole suite of benefits. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a, a case of, of a, a no regrets approach in that there's downstream benefits to communities as well as as benefits to nature and ecological systems as well. I think an important aspect in this regard is also um, working within corridors of, of, of biodiversity from, from Sandy's perspective. So, you know, taking a, what we call a catchment to coast approach. So instead of doing pockets of, of, of restoration, which might benefit, um, you know, a community surrounding that area, if you can, if you can take a corridor approach where, where areas are, are restored or protected all the way through from inland to hinterland where the rain falls and, and water is stored, all the way down through the um, uh, through the landscape to the coast, then there, there's a there's a there's great many benefits in um, in yeah, those corridors with biodiversity can 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 move through. Thanks. Thanks. That's great. Last point on how when we think about the impact on nature, it's not just the pockets. We really need to think about the corridor and the interlinked factor of how the ecosystem resilience and the impact on nature itself need to be think at a bigger scale. Uh, and the Eval, can we go to you next in Vietnam? What have you seen the impacts on nature itself? Yes, uh, in Vietnam, when we work with the um, uh, one area, we make the baseline study. In baseline study, we invite a uh, forest farmer and local authority to join. And based on that, they determine what they have in the uh, area, what uh, they have um, uh, in forest, as a water and land. And based on that, uh, we, we told them that if we use our natural resources with responsibility, we can not, uh, we not only to, uh, to improve our forest, but we also can uh, have the biodiversity in the forest landscape. And we can get more money from by uh, diverse diversity of product under the forest. This is very important when we have the roundtable discussion and uh, uh, group discussion uh, uh, with the farmer. This is why when we, we have the planning to use a natural based solution, almost the people understand. If they do not understand, some people maybe cut the forest and maybe some people want to use a forest land for cultivation for agri-cultivation this is why very imp important we have to make the planning based on society discussion and almost the people in that area have to understand and to discuss how they have the solution this is first issue and the second thing sometimes we 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 have the planning uh, what area we can develop the forest, what area we can develop the farm product. We work together and we develop the value chain from the forest product and agriculture product with the uh, friendly uh, env uh, environment friendly farming, like organic farming, like uh, ecosystem farming. Based on that, people understand that if they have the wood, quality of product they can sell with higher price, they can subsidize their livelihood, they can get more money, they still can keep the uh, forest for longer time. This is a, this is a thing I, I think that after they understand, we have to help them to go on business issue and develop their product by value chain and work private sector. And the third thing, in some cases, uh, yeah. If they, they, they live in a uh, forest area, but some companies, they build a hydro uh, power 
they have to pay money for those uh, for for local authority to subsidy for the people who are living in that area we call it the uh, uh, environment ecosystem uh, fund or payment this is very important that almost the people in that area have to 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 to, to think how we can keep the forest and natural resources if the company they want to do some uh, uh, tourism business they have to pay for the people there also this is the why we encourage the people not only the uh, the the, uh, the government or the farmer to have to to use the natural resources with the responsibility use but the company and other people they get, get more money from their services and from the forest from the water they have to pay money also yes it is in, this is uh, the way we work together but uh, in some cases if we do not have the right table discussion among multi stakeholder the people do not concentrate about their responsibility but when we work with the farmer and with the uh, relevant stakeholder and local authority also and uh, government officer on forestry and agriculture we create the forum for people to talk for the farmer to talk about their problem and almost the people have to think and have to discuss how we solve problem based on the nature uh, the nature based solutions this is why we, we think that but we have to work and listen to the farmer difficult, uh, uh, their difficulty. The second thing, we create the forum and relative discussion among stakeholders to, to, to discuss how we solve problems. And the third thing, we advocate the pol uh, policy uh, maker and ministry and government officer to step by step to develop the policy how we can uh, respond to the problem of farmer based on the natural resources and uh, natural uh, uh, solution based solutions and the, the third thing i think the education from farmer very important also if farmer understand they not only use a very um, uh, responsibly with their farming but they also talk with other stakeholders and they can uh, they can uh, use their resource very carefully for example we have the bamboo forest when we teach them how the bamboo forest can help them not only in the environment protection uh, prevention flood and uh, etc but they can keep for people there the water from the 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 the, the mountain this is why when farmers understand they not only uh, protect the bamboo forest, but they can use uh, water from the mountain to their dry field and they, they can create some tourism, forest tourism for the people to come there to earn the more money, but they keep the forest and they, uh, they, 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 they can make some handicraft the, the, from the forest, they, they sell to the tourism, but they still keep the nature very carefully. And I think it's a very important that we have to listen to the people, discuss with society how we can solve problems, and then we work with them to determine uh, the solution based on the uh, natural resources and encourage almost stakeholders to work together. I think it's very important. Great, yes. thanks. And uh, yeah, it's uh, good to hear that the importance of having that baseline at the very beginning, so then you understand the local conditions of nature, and then you can mm -hmm. monitor better the impacts of nature and design appropriate local solutions. And also mm -hmm. quite interesting then to also hear that the reason that I think all the speakers has been talking about how nature can benefit human and human society more is because the impacts we, in reality, when we want to actually have the positive impacts on nature as Ival, you gave so many examples we must show how improved nature or resilient nature can deliver benefits to most vulnerable communities who are living with those nature 
every day. So you get more multi-stakeholder support than to ensure that there's a positive impact on nature and ensure that nature can be restored and protected and sustainable used. So that's kind of, I think, all speakers specifically emphasize on benefits to human and human societies because of that, as Ival, you speak quite eloquently, giving so much, so many examples from Vietnam. And I think we'll come back also later with our other speakers on the point you mentioned about the importance of multi-stakeholder collaborations and different roles. Uh, but before we go back to that point, Chip, over to you about the kind of how nature-based solution, do you, have you seen impacts on nature itself? How does that uh, help human, but also the ecosystem to be more resilient as well? Yeah, look, I, I think it, it's, um, if we're looking to help communities, then we are looking obviously to, uh, you know, through nature-based solutions, then evidently, I think it's probably evident that uh, we would see a link to the benefits for, for biodiversity and nature itself. And, and given that the UN and, 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 you know, many others are now talking about the biodiversity crisis, uh, probably, um, probably, uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, as is needed, um, there's a real uh, focus, I think, on driving and, and being cognizant of uh, and integrating biodiversity into our plans. Um, AXA uh, in 2018 um, added biodiversity to its corporate responsibility focuses. Um, and we launched last year uh, a 350 million uh, euro fund um, to invest in, in biodiversity. Um, across the world in different projects. And so, you know, for us, it, it's very much a, uh, you know, integral part of, of, of our focus now um, and uh, hugely important that uh, we, we, we look at biodiversity itself uh, alongside the benefits to, to, to communities. Um, but I also think that there's a, there's a, a piece about education and literacy here um, and that the real requirement, um, not only for and I, I suppose this sort of this crosses lots of different boundaries um, from formal education uh, in schools to, to to ensure that in the future we have um, uh, you know leaders um, making decisions making sustainable uh, decisions um, with knowledge of what they're making a decision on um, and then moving into you know the corridors of power and, and indeed um, across the private sector and and the public sectors to better understand the, uh, the, the, the importance of, of biodiversity and nature um, for, for, our, for, our, for our health um, on the planet. Thanks, Chip. That's really good example to hear from private sector of investing in biodiversity and making that uh, integral focus of our future work. And I think that also reflects if everyone knows the leaders pledge on biodiversity that have emerged in the biodiversity UN biodiversity summit in September where we see not just government not only community members but a lot of private sector also is thinking more strategically about how we need to definitely think about not just the benefits for human but at the same time biodiversity itself which basically underlines the human resilience uh, and Eva uh, and uh, Chip are both mentioned about the importance of education and uh, for youth and the farmers all being more educated and making more informed decisions in the future. And uh, again, I would uh, welcome all the uh, participants to ask a questions or share your experiences on this question as well and uh, participate in the Mentimeter. But also at the same time, I just want to go back to Chip and Mike, both of you, because Evol gave us really great examples of how that multi-stakeholder platform works to promote nature-based solutions and the importance of different stakeholders having different roles to play to implement nature-based solutions. We heard from Evol's VNI example where government has payment for ecosystem services, policies that then enable farmers and give finance to farmers to then implement nature-based solution in a watershed, the importance of organizing the community itself because they are the change makers on the ground, and then how to then link with private sector, have a supply chain that make the nature-based solution more sustainable in the future financially. And so it's not just only dependent on 
public sector's finance. So that's a great example from Vietnam. Um, Mike, probably going back to you in South Africa, do you have, have you experienced that type of multi-stakeholder platform? Do you have some examples of, of how different stakeholders can come together to, to work as we all know multi-stakeholder partnership is quite important also to ensure that we use nature to help us manage different risks for different stakeholders. Thanks, I'm saying absolutely that yeah, that, that made multi-stakeholder approach is, is key and, and vital, as you say, to 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 um to demonstrating the benefits and sustaining the sustaining what has been put in place um, after, for example, donor funding project projects end. Um, a couple of examples from the project I just mentioned, in fact, the, the Mgeni Resilience Project. Um, at the community, that there's there's lots of, of different forums where, where, as you say, stakeholders from government to to the private sector down to the community level are, are involved and all kept updated on the on the project progress. But at the community level, it was really interesting, and um, in, in that again, these these forums were developed, and and it only was at that stage that different members from the community, different land users, start seeing the mutual benefits of these nature-based solutions ap ap approaches. Um, so you know where one intervention could benefit so many different people in the same way, whereas before there was kind of a disconnect. So farmers weren't understanding um, that the same intervention could benefit them as could benefit uh, cattle and livestock grazers or, or rearers. Um, and, it, and once the, the, the project took a more integrated approach, the community kind of came together and there was more of a sense of, sort of, sense of ownership in, in supporting these interventions because of the range of benefits to different stakeholders. And, and it's something that, that, um, that Yvonne mentioned earlier, and it's so important, is, is the, the, the business side of it, into, into the private sector, in fact. Um, you know, particularly for donor funded projects because the classic uh, example is where you know donor funding ends and then what you know what what funds are available to sustain the intervention so so again in, in this project um, uh, from a business side it, through this multi-stakeholder engagement it, it became apparent that there were farmers and there were young entrepreneurs and they weren't, weren't necessarily talking to each other so through cooperatives that were established all of a sudden the farmers said well you know we have produce we're not just quite sure how to get it to market and the entrepreneurs said, well, we know exactly how to do that. We're just not sure how to get the produce. So in, in working together, these value chains started emerging. And um, you know, a couple of seasons into the project, there's no longer need for donor funds because farmers are, are taking their share and then you know, re or buying, buying crops and, 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 um, and the inputs they need to continue farming. So it's been a really, really important, important part of the, of the, of the project. And, and there's many examples of such uh, collaboration where, where there's been huge successes um, in other projects as well. Thanks. Great, Mike. Yeah, different stakeholders will have different knowledge of different parts of this complex the puzzle of risk management. So it's great also to hear the example from South Africa. And uh, Chip, I, I think the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance actually is a multi-stakeholder alliance itself. Maybe can you give a little bit more details of how you get those multi-stakeholders to work together and uh, think about risks in the insurance perspective and making the <laughs> nature as a more not uh, no longer an undervalued risk yeah look i, mean, I think that i mean as you say you know aura is very much that that, that sort of multi-sector stakeholder alliance and and i think that the certainly out of the ocean Ridge summit that took place in 2018 we were we sort of realized that there were very few um organizations that were sort of working in this space um, and the fact that if we were looking to build solutions, we need to do it across, you know, cross collaboration. Um, so, you know, that public private partnership is is absolutely critical. So the idea of, of identifying uh, and, I th you know, th the other part of this was about, you know, identifying projects that could be invested in. Um, and the, the pipeline is very short. Um, and so the, the other part of what Aura is doing is, is really sort of to, to, to develop the pipeline of projects um, to bring together you know the risk managers uh, and modelers um, the public sector to potentially bring um, some catalytic funding into the space uh, alongside or concessional funding and alongside you know others from the private sector to to develop um, some you know uh, collaborative solutions into the space and it, it can't be done any other way you know the the, the, the insurance industry cannot cannot do this alone the the finance industry can't do it alone the governments can't do it alone either so we have to we have to be working together and i think that um the you know the the, the role aura can play is sort of is being that convener um and identi identifying sort of the problems that we need to overcome um and and uh, yeah developing solutions and exactly what we're trying to do 
Thanks. That's a great note to almost end our session. That we all in this together, and we all need to work together to think about how then we can use nature-based solution to more effectively manage risks. Unfortunately, we are coming towards the end of the webinar. Um, but before we finish, we do look, need, want to look at the final multimeter result with all of you. Great. Yeah, it, it, it's great to see there's some consensus coming through and we can see that resilience obviously is the most important thing that we need to think about long term solutions, adaptive approach to make sure that both nature and also the humans, our society is resilient to adapt to all those different risks. So the adaptation landscape approach, inclusiveness, uh, it's great to see that those and the multiple landscapes use engagement. It's really important for us to keep all those different components in mind uh, and those enabling conditions for us to all work together as Chip said so well to make sure that we can effectively work with nature to manage different risks. So thanks everyone for participating and I will put, share this with everyone including the recording of this session uh, on the website later. And uh, with that, I just want to thank all the speakers and the participants who gave us such a rich discussion today. <laughs> the session, as I mentioned, the session has been recorded. We'll share after uh, on the event webpage. We hope this small space has provided all of you with some food for thoughts and a useful context. So please continue to discuss with you each other, reach out to others. You met over the webinar and the speakers so we can continue to learn from each other. We do welcome you to give us any feedbacks on the webinar and uh, also welcome you to learn more about IED's work on the intersection between nature climate development, including how to use nature-based solution to manage risks. We very much look forward to future collaborations and continued discussion with all of you. And some of the suggested readings, including some uh, how IED has documented some of the stories of how we can work with nature to manage the pandemic risk in addition to biodiversity risk and the climate change risk. We actually launched a story today um, in conjunction with the local LED adaptation focus of this adaptation week. Uh, so you, you're welcome to look at those stories from all over the world on how working with nature can help people manage risks. And welcome to visit our webpage um, um, on the ecosystem-based adaptation approach for climate change. And also there's some really useful links being shared through the chat box throughout the event. So do have a look. There's some various useful links our speaker have shared that would really highlight their points as well. And again, do send us feedbacks and get in touch if you have any further questions and uh, insights to share with us. With that, we can now officially close the session. Thanks everyone.